Welcome to the dark forest. Jackie and her pals will never bore us. Shameless confessions about our obsession will make us laugh and smile. So let's explore the dark forest and dark down for a Hi, it's Jackie Cation, and you are listening to The Dork Forest. The website's JackieCation.com, DorkForest.com, TheDorkForest.com if you like a determiner. Let's do the credits. Patrick Brady's going to fix this audio and video. Vilmos works on JackieCation.com, and Mike Rickberg uh, sang the song with his wife, Sarah. He composed it, and he will sing his version of the Mexican hat dance at the end of this show. Thank you so much for listening to The Dork Forest. Here's a scoop. I'm doing stand-up online. A lot of Zoom shows will eventually go back on the road. Sign up for my email list. It's easy to get off. It's harder to get on than it is to get off. And no harm, no foul, if ever bored. JackieCation.com. Sign up for the email list. You'll find out about my weekly Zoom shows and stand-up on the road eventually. You may donate to the show if you would like. I would like. Sure, I would. There's PayPal, Jackie at JackieCation.com, and there is a PayPal button on both DorkForest.com and JackieCation.com, and there's Venmo, if you like Venmo, Jackie-Cation, oddly enough. If you have listened to all of the shows, go to DorkForest.Bandcamp.com, I think. The Dork Forest has a Bandcamp page. You can listen to a, but a lot of ones that are free from pre 2000 nine when I started pre-recording and uh then there's a uh, live episodes that cost me a couple of bucks so I charge you a couple of bucks there's also some stand-up there's a story uh album that's very exciting there and um other than that I have a lot of merch in my garage feel free to order if you need, know anybody who doesn't have any cds or the dvd and uh you can follow me everywhere at Jackie Cation let's get into the show Hey, it's me, Jackie Cation. I'm in my living room, and I am now. I'm in my garage. I want to be in my living room so badly, Michael Charbonneau. Uh, welcome <laughs> to the program, Michael Charbonneau. Am I saying Thank it you. right? Am I doing it? You do, yeah, yeah. Oh, you're you're doing stuck. better than most servers at restaurants are doing. You're great. <laughs> stuck the landing, you guys. I went to France <laughs> once. I took five uh, semesters of French and then failed. Uh, well, I, I passed three of them. Let's go with glass half full. Um, welcome. <laughs> You've been a longtime listener, super supporter of my stand-up career, Michael. <laughs> Thank you very much. You sure. saw all five tapings of I, I did, of the yes. new album of Staycation. And I, and I went to the practice show uh, wow. the night before as well. You even saw Wednesday. I forgot about that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We're married now. Because uh, the only other person who did that, besides the people I paid, was Andy Ashcroft. So... Um, and I have lovely had lovely chats with him too. He yeah, was, yeah, he was he, great. He was just, yeah. By the end of it, you guys were like, "Oh, hey, how's it going?" So <laughs> yeah, you were in the know. So um, yeah, so we're gonna do a dork forest, and I asked you what you were interested in, and it's been years since I've read the original Neil Gaiman Sandman, but that was my so that was my serious entry. Like Andy didn't want to give me that as the first comic book I read, so he sort uh -huh, of built up uh -huh. to it. Okay. And but I have read the Sandman Neil Gaiman, right? And you as well, right? Uh, yes, uh, starting with uh, issue issue one. I um, just the my... flimsies, right? You were just buying the regular, yeah, yeah, yeah. The 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 so comics. yeah. So I went um, my. My girlfriend at the time and I, we went to this indoor consignment shop, or I think they called it an indoor flea market, but it was basically they sold consignment areas that were 10 by 10. And some would have clothes and some would have antiques and chotskis and stuff, coins in sure. cabinets, whatever. And there were like two that were comics. Uh, one was just a bunch of boxes strewn together. There was like, you know, just whatever they could cram in there. Sure. And then the other one had like uh, display shelves where they were in plastic and the bags. And I'm kind of looking through and I hadn't really read any comics since I was a kid uh, reading like Richie Rich and Casper, oh, which, right, right. Uh, yeah. which my mom discouraged because religion oh. and <laughs> um, and uh, and, uh, you know, and I once in a while I'd pick up a scary comic. I love the scary comics. Sure. Loved loved scary stuff since I was a kid. Um, but 
so I'm I'm going through this consignment shop and there's this thing called the Sandman and there's the first three issues there and I'm like, what is this? And yeah. so I take the first one out of the bag. Uh, I didn't know about handing comics, but I think I handled it fairly carefully. Fair enough. And I start I I sit down on the floor while my girlfriend's wandering around looking at whatever she's looking at, and I I read through and the next thing I know I'm I'm I have read the first issue, sitting there oh, on the just floor right and I'm there. like. Wow, this is this is this is a great story. And so I'm like, you know, it it just hit all my buttons. I put it back in the bag. I grabbed the three. I got them that day. I I read them. Uh, and then I'm like, where can I get more? I need right. to find a comic shop. So was I this find... in 1989? Like when it, it first? Was. I well, so I it was either 89 or 90. I forget how late exactly. I think it was late 89 that those came out. Right. So I think it might have been early 1990 because issue eight had just come out in the comic book stores. Okay, and they come so, out monthly. So it would have been monthly eight at that months point. after I'm, that. I'm, yep. so, I, so I got number eight, and I, I started backfilling as well as, as collecting forward and got the got the whole run. Uh, there are... Um, there's there's at least one in particular I can tell you where it was when I bought it and read it because of the the impact of that comic that was late in the series I don't want to give any spoilers right right even though it's thirty years old but right it's hard new to people, spoil something new people, that had yeah. a, that now has a TV show and, uh, and we'll they're... have a TV show it's not out yet oh, it's so I don't not want to out. give spoilers for that's that that's true that's that's very sweet of you yes and you're there's correct a, there's a there's an audible adaptation that is in Act Two out of I think it's going to be like four acts so. Oh, so the what first two acts are out on the Audible? In, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Act two just came out oh, last week. Oh, you know what? I am in the middle of it. Yeah, I hear it's actually really good too, right? Yeah, it's it's really well done. Uh, they've they have um, there are a couple of tweaks that were made to the script sure. to kind of catch up with modern times because because yeah. uh, you gotta you, know, you gotta do it. It's Every writer I know is like, I am ashamed of some of the things I said when I was writing earlier. Oh, uh, I have tried to correct that in my in my in my writing as I go along. So, oh right, right. Uh, oh, so there was some sort of sensitive, uh, some jackassery that Neil Gaiman did not know was jackassery I would, at the I time. I wouldn't even call it. Well, it, 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 it might be jackassery now, or but I mean, it's it's uh, it it would be insensitive now. But at the time, he was actually being fairly progressive. Oh, okay. Um, he uh, in in one of the storylines he had a a trans character, uh, in an earlier storyline storyline he had a drag queen, and there were just like little tweaks. It, he didn't need to remove the characters. He didn't need to rewrite them. Yeah. Just just kind of update kind of the sensitivity in dealing with them. Oh, and I, okay. I think that's fine to do. I mean, it it certainly beats uh, you know putting more banthas in Star Wars. Um, right, right, right. Yes, fair enough. Because who needs that? <laughs> um, yeah, the, okay, so um, I totally, I have to, I looked up something on my phone, which means that I looked at my phone, Michael, and then uh, it, I, I received text messages that for some reason, during these, these vital moments, you only get an hour to talk about the thing you love. I am freaking at my phone. Not okay. Okay, so... We'll go over that 30 seconds to a minute when I, okay. okay so I, so I think I read them cause it ran from 89 to 96. That's what I looked up. Right. Yep. And I met Andy Ashcraft in 2003. Okay. And so that's when I read them would have been 2003, 2004 when he was just like, how about these, maybe these <laughs> and a tie, giant stack. And right. <laughs> every year for Christmas, I knew what to get him. Cause I could get him. There was a hundred dollar book of, of the art and the, um, and the story itself of Sandman. Now, traditionally Sandman is like one of the pantheon gods from somebody's culture, right? Correct. Correct. Do we know? Do we know offhand which culture was it? Uh, well, I, I, I think I think uh, one person uh, is like, "Oh, you must be Apollo." This was a Roman emperor. Is like, "You must be Apollo," and he's like, "No, but I'm kind of maybe doing a favor for him." Okay. Um, was kind of the lowdown on that, but um, but yeah, uh, you know the uh, Orniomancer at one point he was called. Okay. Um, and in in Gaiman's universe, he's he's dream of the endless, and the endless are considered they're not gods, they're they're concepts 
personifications of concepts that transcend gods because okay. we'll always have death, whichever gods rise or fall. Sure. We will always dream, whichever gods rise or fall. Yep. Um, so someone so. Did someone to take care of these big concepts. Exactly. And it was dream, and Sandman is dream. And Sandman then there was death. Yeah, he never calls himself Sandman. He's always dream. Oh, he's always dream. Um, or or whatever culture he's dealing in. Okay. He will he will go by whatever name that culture has named him. Okay. Um, but uh, and he will his appearance will change based on what the culture perceives him as. Oh, interesting. Um, I don't. So in, yeah, I need to reread these because they were so beautifully drawn <laughs> too and painted. They were. They were. Um, and the covers were amazing. There, there was one uh, book where they just showed the dust covers. Uh, oh, uh, that just came a book of after, the covers? Yes, after everything was out. All of the Dave McKean covers that he did for oh, all so 75 cool. plus issues. I think there was one special as well as the uh, the individual issues. Okay. So, yeah, um, so, so it's, that it's uh, death, dream, wait. Death so I will say dream, again, yeah. I, I I worry about spoilers. But in the beginning, we learn about uh, death. Or we learn about dream. They were trying to capture death. They captured dream. So we learn about those two like right away in a, in the first one. There's um, desire comes in pretty quickly. Yep. Uh, and talks to her sister, um, despair. Yep. And then we know that there's someone who's like behind like kind of a covered thing. And we, we, we learn of this person as the prodigal or this endless as the prodigal who apparently has left. And so we don't actually know his name till like halfway through for sure. Okay. There, there are hints here and there all the way through. Um, and then uh, uh, pretty early on, also by the third major storyline, uh, delirium comes in uh, right. as well as destiny. And Destiny, so, that's right. So that's like five. That's um, six. That's out six. Of seven. And the prodigal's the sort of the spoiler. You don't want to spoil it. I don't, um, I'd like to not spoil that because that'll be that'll be again coming coming up in the uh, in the Audible series. Mm -hmm. It's it's going to be past the part that's currently released. Okay. That'll be in Act Three, and then um, it'll it'll definitely be part of the uh, the Netflix special. But right. his the the storyline involving them is one of my my favorites. It's the brief line story life. Okay. Uh, storyline. So it's I, I remember because here's now. I know that they are they are siblings of a sort, the endless. Yes, yes. And um and we we come in to the to the to the dreaming, to the to the first story of Sandman that Sandman has been captured. And right. and he ha he must escape. So that this is no spoiler here. That's and the first issue, yes. That is the first issue and um I think in the reboot we get to meet are you are you reading the the current dreaming? Uh, not written by Neil Gaiman. Uh, I started it when it first came out a little it's, over a year ago, but I have not caught up. Yeah, it's also stuttery. You know, like it's not regular, so it's hard yeah, to yeah. know that another one's come out unless you have a pull list. And right. um, so I just read, and and for some reason that guy that captured Dream is in. Oh, he's in the new one for uh, a second, Roderick. Uh, the character, uh, Meredith, Meredith Roderick. Nice, Meredith something that sounds uh, that sounds great. I, I feel like I'm flubbing it anyway. Oh, you're not flubbing it, and uh, because I would say this now, the 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 Sandman series is so interesting because Neil Gaiman, the other things that he wrote are uh, like he wrote that magic series about the magical yes. boy, which uh, the books is, of magic, the books of magic, which are about uh, a young boy with brown hair. And Timothy glasses Hunter. Uh, that uh, looks suspiciously years, half a decade before Harry Potter looks almost yes. exactly like Harry Potter. Yep. And uh, so whoever did the art for uh, the covers of the Harry Potter books clearly read the books of magic <laughs> and or saw those covers. And yep. um, and, th and that and that boy was also a boy, you know, sort of Messiah. And yes. um but you know nobody owns the messiah story that right one, exactly not yes. even the christians i'm so sorry <laughs> and uh the uh but but it was it was the thing i think like he was always very popular but i think sandman put neil gaiman on the map right sandman was his first real um 
real kind of breakthrough. He had done <laughs> before that he had done he he was a journalist first. Then as part of his journalism job, he got assigned to do a biography of Duran Duran. Okay. Uh, which reportedly he, he admitted this once to Simon Lebon and Simon's like, Oh yeah, which one? And yeah. Neil told him and he's like, oh, I kinda like that one. Oh there you go. So, oh so there you were so he... many like unauthorized biographies of oh, Duran Ghost Duran Rider kind so, of uh, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. I think I read one of Billy Joel in the eighties. Yep. Anyway. And then after I had um after I'd started reading Sandman, uh I became aware that he had written a book called um don't panic the virtue the guide the official guide to companion to the hitchhiker's guide to the universe what and i'm like i bought that book way back when i was interested in douglas adams hitchhiker guide series right. i own that book and i go and i it's... find it in my bookcase and yes neil gaiman wrote this uh... it's so interesting that british <laughs> nerds all know each other like the right, terry pratchett right. douglas adams neil gaiman mm -hmm. they're just it's uh you know, it's so interesting. Are they were was Douglas Adams? Do you think older than Neil Gaiman? I believe he, died he was at least yeah, about yeah, fifteen yeah. years ago, right? Um, uh, yeah, it's been a while. I don't know yeah. the exact year. I did. I did get to see Douglas Adams at a signing in Denver um, uh, before he passed away. He was doing his uh, the last chance to see the I one about the Galapagos. That. Oh really? I I went in Minneapolis. I we didn't awesome. get to see him because it was so packed. We got to ah. hear him. We we were in the back. <laughs> I brought my nephew, who's uh, clearly he's like forty now, um, and he wanted to crawl to the front, and I wouldn't let him. I regret that to this very day, because he was a boy. He was a child. He could have right. totally squoze up there and got to I see was, Douglas Adams. I was uh, I was uh, adult, but but somewhat younger than I am now. And, uh, I, as, as, as you know, from me showing up at the comedy club, I tend to get to these things early. Oh, so I can so get you, a good seat. Oh, you, so I was seated. I was able to see him, that uh, is outstanding. And, uh, listen to him. He was a uh, joy to listen to. Oh, that's he's um, really, yes. He was the Howard Zinn of, of, of science fiction. So, uh, <laughs> that's, the, that's my Douglas Adams accolade. And, uh, <laughs> but, but the the thing about Sandman is that, and I, you know, I don't have a huge, I mean, I don't think we're spoiling it too much to say that, because it's about, it's just, it's episodic, right? There are arcs to it. Absolutely. And every, uh, so everything ends up tying in, even, even the short stories, um, you end up. Uh, realizing, oh, this is kind of connected to that. It's like there are things that kind of show things in the past where the main story is going from basically 89 to 96, right. um, kind of in, in real time. Is the main um, story, it isn't, because now, I'm. you know what, I'll just put a spoiler alert on, on okay. this one because sure. I I don't remember enough and, and it, I don't sincerely believe it will not ruin um that's fair the reading of let's it. go let's go spoilers we've given people the chance to duck out if they want to right right let's We're, go whole hog it's exactly. been out 30 years exactly it has been out 30 years you're about to and so i remember some amazing things about it which was like that bar which was a storytelling bar the the the, the world's end. The world's end. That's it. Yes. That's been recurring in other Vertigo things, other people. So he created that, right? He so did, yes. Yeah. He created so many things that have been used in other Vertigo stories. Lucifer sure. came out of this. Absolutely. You know? The current concept of Lucifer that's being used in the TV show came out of the Sandman comics. Right. And um, and so the the idea of of death as this sort of you know, hot eighties goth chick yep. is awesome. Was awesome. Yes. She had, there was humor. There was, there was so much in this that what I, what I, uh, I'm going to talk about your dorkdom, Michael. Uh, at <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> because I just, I think that I'll just be here to answer any questions you have. Go any for questions. it. <laughs> because I, I think that, that one of the great things about the Terry Pratchett, Neil Gaiman Good Omens. Yes. Is that Terry Pratchett is a silly, he was a silly, silly man. Absolutely. And but he was very funny. Neil yes. Gaiman is a deathly serious man <laughs> who is occasionally funny. 
Yes, I will agree with that. And so the two of them together made good omens. It rose both. It took the best of their their things and brought it together. Absolutely. I have I have seen Neil Gaiman uh, talk just in general and answer questions to the public a few times, um, and he he asked he was asked about um, you know how how he and Terry came to write Good Omens, and uh, you know I'm me so this is a degree removed but I'll try to get this story as correct as Fair I remember enough. it. Um, that's my disclaimer once. I'll try not to say that every time I relate a story. Um, so. He said that uh, he had he had come up with this story idea and he got like the first part of it down and he he showed it to Terry Pratchett and then he he was kind of stuck and so he waited and then Terry called him a little while later and said uh, hey that that story you have um, I I don't necessarily know how it ends but I know what happens next do you mind if I well I can either I can either run with the story that you've given me so far or if you want we can we can write it together and because Neil Gaiman wasn't an idiot he said let's write it together yes yes <laughs> and uh and yeah I think I think it came out and showed um kind of the the best of both of them it's um, true did he write american gods after Good omens. Yes, yes. American Gods didn't come out until I was actually listening to the newly purchased audiobook when I came across the country from Denver to San Francisco in 2001. Okay. Um, late 2001, it came out, um, and I, I have an interesting Caroline American Gods story to tell you a little bit sure. later. Sure. But um, but yeah, uh, yeah. So American Gods came out. He yeah, Sandman was finished long before then. Okay. And it was the first thing he did since Sandman that really kind of had a little bit of the same flavor to it, dealing with with gods and mythologies and and stuff like that. Do you know when when Good Omens came out? Was that after American Gods? No, 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 no. That was earlier. Um, right. And honestly, because, let's see. Because I wonder about the things that he wrote after that collaboration with Terry Pratchett, if it has a little more silliness to it, if it has a little more lightness to it. Because American uh, Gods was much like Sandman. Yeah. American Deathly... Gods was 1990. Okay. Yeah. And so when was Good Omens? I'm sorry. Oh, Good, Good Omens... Omens was 1990. Uh, American Gods was 2001. Oh, okay. Wow. So Sandman, so Good Omens, a... American Gods. Yeah. There we go. That's why American Gods is deathly serious, but literally a little <laughs> sillier. Right. Yeah. It is. It has a, a more light. I just reread uh, American Gods as a comic book. They they did a oh. uh, they did a graphic adaptation of it. And now, it was I know actually been, beautiful. I know they've been doing the tie-in to the TV series. Is it that one, or is it an adaptation of the original novel? I think it started before the TV show, and then it just okay. continued from the TV show. Okay. And um, and I have not watched. I didn't. I haven't watched. There's several TV shows that I have not watched that I want to watch. Uh, American Gods being one of them. Um, Why the Last Man, which is Brian K. Vaughn, right? Um, on Hulu FX, which is I think only two episodes in, and. Okay. Uh, but that it has sort of a zombie apocalypse kind of vibe to it, which is not yeah. my jam, even though Fair. I will read some of the darkest comic books. I cannot, for some reason, read a dark prose right. and I can't watch dark TV and movies or scary and like lock and key. I wouldn't I would never watch lock and key. <laughs> I'm sure that was a beautiful rendition of, of comic book that I refused to read before bed. That's so, one that I need to get to. I've heard wonderful things about that. And the first, uh, I think, three arcs of that are funny and smart. Joe Hill was so good. Right. So good. And it had nice, dark humor to it. Okay. So Sandman wasn't that funny. I mean, the, if the funniest character in your book is um, Death, <laughs> that's weird, man. And uh, <laughs> I love Cain and yeah. Abel. Cain and Abel. Sure. Was amazing. Yes. And, um, but the storylines on it and the, and the art made it so beautiful. Lu the Lucifer storyline was, was my favorite is that was when he gets uh, the season keys. of miss when he, uh, when he quits hell, when, yeah, when, when Lucifer quits hell and yes. gives the key to dream and then all of the different gods of death from all the different pantheons are like, can I have the keys to that? 
Can I? Right, can I, right. Can I yeah, that? yeah, yeah. Some of them were like, "We want to live there. We want to take it over." Yeah. And then uh, Ferry is like, "We want it to stay empty because we're tired of paying taxes to hell." Because that's part <laughs> of our compact with hell. Yeah. Right, and I think he ends up giving it to some angel because he's like, "You could fix this." Yeah, he he had not decided what to do with it, and the angels are like, "Have you decided?" And he's like, "No." And they're like, "Hold on, we got a message from God for you." Uh-huh. And uh, and they they're like, "We are taking it over. It's going to be back to doing what it's supposed to do." Which is which is a place where people punish themselves. Yes. And uh, it was such an interesting version of hell, right? Yes. It was such an interesting version of what we do to ourselves and the creation of such a thing, right? Absolutely, yeah. Matter, somebody... I mean, it had aspects of, of Dante in it, but also mm-hmm. aspects of a lot of modern conceptions of we make our own hell. So. Nothing's more modern than Keanu Reeves when asked what happens after death. Someone asked Keanu Reeves what happens after death. I can't. Uh-huh. I, I don't know where that quote came, came from, but this is so... It might be apocryphal. Someone could check uh-huh. it. But supposedly, sure. Keanu Reeves, someone asked him what happens after death. And he says, the people who loved you were sad. The people who loved you are sad. Which is such, it doesn't have anything to do with you, it turns out. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> it's nice. kind of an amazing, well done, Keanu. You know, it's, uh, who knew? Yep. Um. Yeah, so what are what are your and, and the wake? That's the one. That's the other one. The wake. Yeah, so so yeah, I mean we we have the beginning where he's captured, he escapes, uh he gets his tools back. That's the first uh oh, Right. Arc. The first arc he has to go grab his yeah, his and that keys. has some yeah. some horrifying bits in it. The the um the bit with the 24-hour diner where John D is torturing those people yes. is just devastating yes. um and some of those characters end up connected to later characters oh yeah um and i love later his story through lines. line i love his yeah. through line. yeah it's it's very it, it the sandman comic to me was the first time i'd seen i mean it's the first i'd read novels before and novels obviously have things where things hint at other things foreshadowing whatever but this is the first thing where i'd seen a long form thing like that where a thread was left loose and then just picked up seemingly randomly later that connected directly back toward the beginning of the story. And I'm like, this is amazing. You're right. Because before that, all we had was, was it might've been Vonnegut or Heinlein uh, or both of them who Mm -hmm. had recurring characters. Sure. That were from other books that came up in new books in entirely disparate, you know, uh, unlikely. This is the first time where you thought, no, he knew he was going to use these characters again. With Vonnegut right. and and Heinlein, I never thought that they I felt like that was a publisher move. People love that character. Could you bring that guy back? Right. Well, and there was there was like Asimov's mood, which is like, you know, let's try to tie all of my stuff together. And so we'll make these people appear in foundation and these people and it's like, okay, whatever. Right, but, it, but it feels retcon y. It doesn't yeah, feel exactly. Yeah, it really it, does. Yeah, it doesn't feel yeah. organic. And I think Neil Gaiman made it feel like he knew he he wanted to create entire people yeah, that exactly. could show up later. And right. then in his storytelling process it it felt organic when they showed up yep. again. Well, and there's Unity Kincaid who fell asleep in in issue one, and she her granddaughter is the second main storyline, the Doll's House. Yes. Um, and then that goes from there, and then there was um, uh, the set of Dream Country, which is four individual one shot stories. Oh yeah. Uh, which includes um. Uh, Shakespeare performing for Dream and for Fairy, which won a World Fantasy Award. Did it? And then the World Fantasy people went, well, we don't want comics being eligible for our award. (gasps) And so they passed a rule against it. I don't know if they have opened that up or if they have made a new category since then. But... um, I, I think they so are. They were they, looking down their nose at comics. Exactly. And, uh, he, they what they gave him the award, and then every, the sort of the people around him were like, "No, short stories are the best <laughs> form of 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 prose or right, storytelling." Right. And they're like, "It's good. Uh, everything can be good." 
Yeah, yeah. It's uh, um, yeah. The judgment against comic books is lifting, of course. It's I mean, I think it's fully lifted. But it used to just be sort of this, you know, that's my that's my dumb little brother, you know, kind of thing. Right, right. And and now it is it's a cash cow. You know, if you talk to comic book store owners, 20 years ago, they so many people coming in, they're like, I'm constantly getting showrunners coming in here going, what's what's popular among the nerd kids? And <laughs> you're just like, why don't you read a comic book and get out of my right. store? I'm not going to do your research for you unless you are willing to pay me. And because right. the comic book store owners, they don't have any money. They have a, they have right. an obsession. Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's like, this is my collection and I'll sell you some of it as a sideline. Right. I'm going to I'm gonna try to get together this, this one thing that I'm trying, this Holy Grail over here, but in the interim, look at this yep. saga. Yep. And so, or whatever. <laughs> That's awesome. Yep. Um, so, so let's see. So that's I, I, and I don't. I, I mean, yeah. I can go through all of these. The wake is the last one. That's uh, right. That is, uh, um, and we'll again. Spoiler alert, people. Yep. After after Dream dies in the Kindly Ones, mm -hmm. the last one is the wake, and it um, it has the actual um, kind of uh, uh, ceremony for for uh, the Morphe death of uh, endless. Yes. Yeah. For, for Morpheus particularly, but yeah. then someone else takes on the mantle of dream uh, at the same time. And is wearing a white uh, robe instead of a black robe. And is wearing a white robe. robe. And, uh, and is that's a little... how we know it's a different guy, but because it, it right. looks like the same guy. Well, and it's a different personality. And yeah. um, and he goes he goes through and tries to do, you know, some good things. He's like, you know, Matthew, you can hang around if you want. You don't have to. I can find another raven. Yep. He, uh, he tries to bring Fiddler's Green back. Uh, because Fiddler's Green was part of the dreaming. Uh, right. He was also from that second storyline, um, and we see him a little bit through the series as well, uh, in flashbacks, but he had died um, at one point uh, in, during the Kindly Ones. Mm -hmm. And um, so Daniel tries to bring him back, and he's like, I lived a good life, and I'm dead. Leave me dead. Yeah. And, uh, 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 of course, uh, Fiddler's Green, you may know, uh, patterned after uh, G.K. Chesterton. No, um, I do not oh, know. you did not know that. I've never even heard of G.K. Chesterton. <laughs> I bet he, you that's huge. Uh, he he was very, I think he was popular in his time. Uh, he had an influence on Gaiman. Um, okay. Uh, he wrote some kind of, I think, slightly surreal fiction. I have not read a lot of his stuff, but I went back and found uh, one that I think Gaiman had mentioned called The Man Who Was Tuesday. And this is old enough you can find it in uh, public uh, domain archives. Okay. So um, so you can find that. And, of course, there are people still printing these things because why not make a buck off of stuff that's already in the free? public domain. Yeah, yeah. Right. So Gilbert um, Keith Chesterton was an uh, English writer, philosopher, lay theologian. I'm a lay <laughs> theologian. Come on. And right. literary art crit and art critic. He has been referred to as the Prince of Paradox. Uh, 1874 to 1936, uh, influenced by Charles Dickens, Thomas Aquinas. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, wow. All right. Uh, I'm, I'm, there, I'm definitely going to read more about him because he sounds fascinating. There is a quote that Gaiman put at the beginning of one of his um, novels. I'm not sure which one. I think it was one of the young adult ones. But it was... Something like um, uh, fairy tales are more than true, not because they teach us that dragons exist, but because they teach us that dragons can be defeated. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Love that one. Yeah, that's. Um, and it's it's attributed to Jake. He he, he attributes it to uh, G.K. Chesterton, but I'm mm -hmm. not sure that it's an actual, I, I think he might've misattributed it or condensed it or made it up, but right. Right. You know, and Cause, as, cause as he points out, writers are liars. So you can't writers are him. liars. And you know what Elliot Cation says? Don't let the truth get in the way of a good story. Absolutely. Uh, and, so, uh, and I'm sure yeah. he never, he didn't say that first. I'm sure he stole that from somebody. I'm uh, sure. Because <laughs> that is uh, some of the jokes that I've written about him. He's like, remember when I said that? And I was like, I actually wrote that. You actually didn't <laughs> say that at all. And he was like, I would have. 
I would have said that. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so... That's you telling a great story without letting your dad's truth get in the way. Exactly. Don't let it get in the way. <laughs> and um, so I was once one of the first live action role playing games that I was in was a Sandman LARP. Wow. Andy and his buddy Lee ran three different Sandman LARPs throughout the 90s, the late night, it, uh, right after it's, you know, like mm -hmm. I think it was like 93, 98. 2000 and the last one they did was the wake and nice. uh it was 40 people in this wow. thing they rented uh -huh. a theater okay. uh, <laughs> people who wanted to could write one act plays starring one of the endless wow so okay. there were okay. seven different sort of 10 minute the damn thing took all day Right at uh, all night. Sure. I believe uh, the, the food and wine uh, flowed freely. I was going to say, as a good wake does. Yes, so. yes, and um, the different uh, the different plays were, which because we never knew at the beginning of the story, the wake who had died. In the LARP. Oh, okay. All right. And so they so in the live action role playing game, any one of them could have died. It was uh, all it was all in the game mechanics. It was like Sandman and Clue all pieced together. Right. It was it was <laughs> Clue with Destiny and, and and so each of the different one act plays were to be the death of a different endless and how and why they died. That sounds awesome. It was awesome. Maria Bamford played an extra in The Death of Desire and she played Apathy. Ah. And Apathy okay. kills Desire. <laughs> that, and, that that is so awesome in itself and it is so maria and they still talk about it the 40 the people who were at that larp were just like maria was amazing yes. and uh as was jim who wrote it and played desire um and because they're because jim is an actor and maria is an actor or can act right right and um and and just stuck the it was just awesome, I uh, I I was a messenger much like my actual acting career I uh, <laughs> I had small bit parts where I just delivered things right and uh, so, best friend messenger sure uh, airport cop right and uh, so but the uh, but the the I remember the art of the covers oftentimes being this is just going way back I've just decided mm -hmm. to. Bring us back to some some other a new starting point, right? Sure, go for it. Watercolors. Some of them water were colors. in watercolors. If I yeah, or were they so oils? The, right. Well, so the it's funny the original Dave McKean covers. This was fascinating to me, and I I think I I think I learned this early on by reading the columns at the back of the comics, you know, the letter columns. Which only Andy reads of uh, the two of us. I never right. read them. And he's like, did you read that great column? <laughs> did you read that great essay? And I was like, I am so sorry to tell you I did not. Well, and that's something that they never reproduce with the graphic novels. It, I, you know. Oh, uh, right, right. So the letters like or the essays. If you have the yeah. it's because you have the original comics. Yeah. But I think at one point he had, uh, uh, one of the staff or Neil had answered a question about how are these covers done. And it's, he, uh, Dave McKean, he would do, he would do this kind of background painting and then he would build like 3D on top of it. And oh, so wow. you had like, um, the, the covers had little pieces of art along the sides and tchotchkes and yeah. stuff that had to do with, like the, with the content. Yeah. yeah, it was like a frame. And then he would take a picture of that for the cover. Oh. Um, and, and so, yeah, quite involved. $150. Like, when, when you think about, like, the, what you get paid for cover art in comic books, I don't think it's right. a great deal of money. Uh, Probably not. No, and because I remember Andy telling me that when he looked into it, when he was in college, he wanted to be a comic book artist. Uh -huh. And it was... It was eight pages for something like $150. And he was talking to his art teacher about it. And the art teacher was like, wait, what? What What, what are they doing? And uh, <laughs> he was like, that isn't livable. What is happening? Right. And, um, yeah, so it's, um, but they were so gorgeous. And his name's Dave yeah. McKean. Dave McKean, yeah. What else? Um, McKean, yeah. Yeah. And uh, Dave McKean, um, I don't remember if he 
if he wrote the script, but he did the artwork for, I want to say, uh, Arkham Asylum. Okay. The original Arkham Asylum Batman. Okay. Um, he's done some of his own work. He had a, a graphic, he, he, he was doing like a 10 part story called Cages, which the last like two issues took forever to come out. And finally they did and they collected it in a graphic novel. Mm -hmm. So that's available It's in, in its entirety. That has a little bit of um, kind of, it, it seems like normal life, but there's a little bit of magic going on in the fringes and it okay. impacts the characters. Um, uh, he, uh, when, when Jim Henson company was trying to make a comeback, uh, I want to say, boy, late nineties, early two thousands. Okay. I might have to look at the book behind me again, but, uh, <laughs> they, they approached, um, uh, Gaiman and right. said, uh, we, we would like you to, uh, do a movie. Uh, and Gaiman's like, I wanted to have, uh, McKean direct and we'll, will work on the concept and the art will write the story and he'll direct it. And that became a film called mirror mask. Oh, um, wow. I remember that. Yeah. And, uh, it, it definitely had a lot of the, the, uh, the game and, uh, kind of trademarks of, you know, person in the normal world conflict goes to another world, resolves the conflict, comes back to the normal world. Things are much better, uh, right. for this, for this young adult and yes. their relationship with the other people. Um, and Mirror you know, Mask Coraline was beautiful. and all this. Yeah. Yeah. Coraline yeah, has uh, the same. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, and, um, yeah, Mirror Mask was, was absolutely beautiful. Um, just uh, stunning, weird, beautiful art, um, uh, on the screen, uh, and yeah, I, uh, if, if people have not seen Mirror Mask, they should go out and find it. Um, it's, I mean, it's not going to be, it's kind of like if Labyrinth was serious. Oh, right, right. Oh my God, that's a perfect And didn't analogy. have David Bowie's crotch as a main star <laughs> in the uh, in the film. Um, right, right. Uh, maybe, maybe a little scarier than Labyrinth. So you might want not want to sit your four-year-old down to watch it. But, right, yes. But I think it's, it's a good uh, preteen, teen movie. Yeah, yeah, so. 11 and up, I would say. Yeah, yeah. So um, Mirror Mask, 2005 fantasy film, designed mm -hmm. and directed by Dave McKean, written by Neil Gaiman. Um, nobody's in it. Nobody famous. So, no. um, uh, well, Lenny Henry, uh, has a little bit of a following. He was, he had kind of a small part in it, but, um, yeah, it was a small done... part. He doesn't come up with the first five. Right. People. Right. Uh, Lenny Henry was, uh, he was in a comedy, uh, British series called chef way before John Favreau did his film chef. Yes. Um, and, uh, he has also done, he did the reading for the, uh, Anansi boys, um, oh, audible, okay. uh, uh, so, which is kind of a, it's like uh, a, a funny sequel to American Gods. Okay. Uh, um, if you haven't read Anansi Boys, you absolutely should. Anansi uh, Boys is pretty great too, actually. Yeah. It turns yeah. out I might've read a lot of Neil Gaiman. Yeah. Uh, Cause I'm like, I read Coraline. <laughs> I read Mirror. Yeah. So let me tell my Coraline story. Please. In, uh, in um, 2000, mm -hmm. uh, I was living in Denver the uh, World Horror Convention uh, came to Denver. It was their that city. They like World Worldcon. They travel around different cities, and so the World Horror Convention was there. Um, and um, what with my girlfriend and I don't remember. We might have even stayed in the hotel. We were we were local, but mm -hmm. I don't remember anyway. But we were. Neil Gaiman was there along with many, many other people. Right. Um, Peter Straub was there. Wow. Um, uh, not like Stephen King, but he wasn't nominated for anything. Right. Uh, they, they were giving out the, the World Horror Awards, uh, which I have a story about Gaiman and the, and the World Horror, uh, that, that uh, Horror Awards, too. Okay. So um, anyway, but one, yeah. one night... Uh, Neil's like, uh, Hey, you know, I'm going to read kind of a story. We're going to start. It's a late night story. Um, we'll start about, uh, 10 30. I think it was 10, maybe, um, maybe even as late as 11. But so he starts, he says, I'm going to read you. I, I can either read you from something that, um, that I've already done or something that is about to come out or something that will come out later. Okay. Uh, and we're like, 
let's do the thing that's going to come out later. So we right, get right. a little so bit we, of an advance yeah, preview. Yeah. We voted on that. Maybe 40 of us in the room. Okay. At most. Um, like an upstairs convention room off the main path. Um, so between 20 and 40 of us. And we're sitting there and Neil Gaiman starts reading Coraline. And <clears throat> he he says, um, uh, he, he gets about halfway through the book. And it's been like maybe an hour and a half. And he what? says, guys, I need to, my, my throat is dry. Yeah. I either need to stop for the night or if you want, I can, we can take a break for about 15 minutes. We can hit bathrooms. We can get something to drink and I can, I can keep reading. And we're all, are you insane? <laughs> yes. We will, we will take our break and we will come back because we right. want to finish the story. It's a horror story. convention and a horror <laughs> and, and all cons are all night. So it's like 12, 1230 at this point. Right. So we're looking at staying up till like one thirty, listening to Neil Gaiman tell us Gaiman tell us a bedtime story. Yeah. Um, so uh, so he reads so the rest awesome. of Coraline and he says, um, and we're like, when's it going to be out? We want to we want to get this book. And he's like, well, this one is done. Mm -hmm. I'm still working on American Gods, which isn't quite finished. Mm -hmm. But my publisher wants to put out American Gods first, right? So that adults are more familiar with me so that when a kid says, hey, I want this Neil Gaiman book, the adults will go, oh, I know that name, and uh -huh. they will buy the book for their kids. Okay. So we got to hear Caroline, which was done first, uh, like, I don't know, at least two years before it was right, released. It had to be 88, because didn't you just say American Gods no, came out in 90? No, no, 2001. Yeah. So yeah. 2001 so, was uh, so American Gods. Yeah. Yeah, and this was uh two, the world the 2000 was the horror festival where oh, we okay. listened to it. Nice. Uh, world horror uh, convention. So yeah, um so it was a lot of fun. Um the other highlight of that convention for me. Sure. Two highlights. One was that my my girlfriend at the time had this bunny that she liked taking to cons and getting pictures of the bunny with a local live actors. rabbit? No, no. It, oh, was, it was it was a, a it was a stuffed animal toy. It was a funny. stuffed animal. There you go. It was cute. Um, sure. And um, and at it's one a point con. we catch. She could bring much worse things than a stuffed bunny. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> absolutely <laughs> so... she could. So we catch Neil Game and he's down on the on the uh, 16th Street Mall where the hotel is, uh, having a cigarette. And um, my, my girlfriend's like, "Would you mind if we had you take a picture with this?" And he's like, "No, absolutely." And he like holds it up, pointing to it. If I can find the picture, I'll send it to you. Yes, please. It's delightful. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> I should tag Neil in it too. Um, we can all but, tag Neil. <laughs> but uh, but it's uh, it's cute. It's wonderful. So that and then um, my girlfriend, we're waiting to get a book signed by Harlan Ellison, who was also there. Sure. He was having none of that crap. He is a serious author. He would never have his picture oh, taken. With I'm a sorry. Step Look on. what I brought for Harlan Ellison. Oh, anyway, that's, so... that's very appropriate. Yeah. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That, that old, I mean, that old Har bird thing. Harlan yeah. Ellison is known as a... As a hard ass. As as a hard ass and a sexist. And I mean... Didn't he, he slap he, someone's ass? Connie no, Willis? He he grabbed Connie Ellis's boob on stage, as I recall. Okay. I would have to look up the incident again, but I, I think it was a boob Connie grab. Connie Willis. I don't think it was, yeah. yeah. She wrote Doomsday Book, right? She wrote Doomsday Book. She's written... Oh, she is so wonderful. She the was dog. the first woman... She was the... Yeah. Uh, to Say Nothing of the Dog. To Say Nothing of the Dog. Yeah. I yes. loved... Both of those Which, were my, uh, my two favorite of hers. Yeah, yeah. Well, and they're they're basically the same universe. Yeah, maybe. Um, yeah, no, they are. Um, oh, are they? Okay. Yeah, they're set in the 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 current time in the book is set in Oxford, where they have a time traveling division. Yes, they do. And then they go to the Black Plague <laughs> accidentally, and then they Acc go to this Victorian age accidentally. Um, yeah, no, well, um, but the, no, the Victorian no, that, age was on, was on purpose, but the guy like bonks his head and loses his memory. Right. And comedy ensues. <laughs> Unlike the Doomsday Book where everything is miserable. Everything is miserable. <laughs> She's like, we're not going to go when it's the Black Plague. Clearly, I don't want to go during, and I've been inoculated. I've been vaccinated anyway, but it's, right. we're going to go just before it. I just want to do a little social studies about right, right before right. the Black Plague. And exactly. then, of course, uh, a fuse blows and she ends up in the middle of the black light. So there you go. So, um, so anyway, so okay, the other so, new game yeah. story, we'll get yes, back to please. Gaiman. Um, so, um, 
I um, uh, we there's the banquet where they're going to give out the uh, the World Horror Awards. Um, I believe it's like a little Lovecraft uh, figurine. Okay. And um, there's different categories, and uh, I am sitting at a table. I I'm like. I could just go and sit at Neil's table, but I don't have the guts for that. So I'm like, me and my girlfriend, it's like, I know some other local authors around there. Sure. And so, okay. So I sit at a table with uh, um, uh, Trish uh, Kasich, uh, okay. Peter Kasich. Um, and uh, she's not as well known, but uh, she's done some wonderful yeah. work. Uh, she was living in Denver at the time, has now moved back east. But... Um, so I'm like, I know her, I'll sit, we'll sit with her. And, uh, you know, Peter Straub joins us at our table and it's mm -hmm. like, okay, well, we have, we have people here. Um, and it's like, you know, my mind's being blown by all the kind of leading horror writers around the room. Right. Um, so, um, we're sitting there, Neil Gaiman, uh, has been nominated for, um, uh, Sandman, the Dream Hunters, which is more prose than comic, okay. uh, but it has some beautiful illustrations by um, by a Japanese illustrator that he met when he was when Gaiman was doing the interpretation for the movie Princess Mononoke. Studio okay. Ghibli movie. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's, so that's your, that's Michael Charbonneau's uh, other dorkdom, by the way. Yes. Uh, of, um, but knowing your heart, as you can imagine, a uh, bit of a diamond, <laughs> many facets of a, a, a dork horse diamond. Yes, go ahead. Indeed. Um, so uh, so he'd met this artist and uh, wanted to do uh, a Japanese dream story, and so you know, consultant with this guy a bit, and this guy did the art, and it came out beautiful. And it was nominated for uh, this fantasy horror award. And um, so uh, he wins. And so he he gets up from his table, he walks up to the, the platform they have there in the in the room, and he gets behind the thing, and he, he's holding the award, and he says, you know, uh, thank you very much. It's, it's uh, always great. And you... You sit down there at the table and you say to yourself, it's an honor to be nominated. It's an honor just to be nominated. And you say it so long to yourself that it blurs together. It's just an honor to be nominated as one word. And um, it is an honor to be nominated, mm -hmm. but it's also really fucking great to win the award. <laughs> and he, he walks off the stage uh, to applause, as you can imagine. Awesome. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so it was, it was great to see him uh, to be there when, when he won something like that. that um, right. Just to be in the room sort of when those things happen. You yeah. get to hear like really great speeches, really kind of weird. Sometimes there's like weird one-off stories that that somebody tells, yeah. and and you're like, more please, <clears throat> more please. <laughs> you're just like, what? How? What else happened in your life that was interesting? Yes, yes. I love it. An interesting story. It's why we read, right? It's why we do any of Absolutely. this stuff. It's for the interesting stories. So if you got a real one, let's hear it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. That's awesome. Um, Let's see. Yeah. So those I, are your Neil Gaiman stories. Those are those are the two main. I mean, those were. I mean, there was. I've I've been to a number of signings. Mm -hmm. The first, I'll tell you about the first signing I went to. Season of Miss had just come out mm -hmm. uh, as a hardback. So I'll back up a little bit in Neil's timeline. They finished uh, what is now known as uh, Preludes and Nocturnes, which is the first one right. where he escapes and gets his tools back. Right. Right. Um, they finished that comic run and then they went through um, uh, the doll's house. Yeah. And then the doll's house they released as a graphic novel without having released the first one. So Neil wrote this kind of one page, the story so far mm -hmm. that basically covered the events that are in. Uh, and it started with issue eight, which is kind of like, it's like between the two, it, it's like it's like a Venn diagram where it's like it finishes the first one yes. and it also sets up the second one. Yes. But they wanted to have it in the only graphic novel they were sure they were publishing at the time. Okay. Um, so then uh, that comes out. I don't remember. They they may have released it before they released the uh, third and fourth ones. So the third one was Dream Country, which was the four one things. And then there was Season of Miss, yep. which was a big thing. And they're like, okay, for this one, we're going to go hardcover. We're going to yes. release a hardcover for this one. Um, so I'm like, 
Uh, you went to I'm, the signing or something. I'm, yes, I did. So I was, I was living in Denver. Boulder is like 30 miles up from Denver. Yeah, it's I'm like, I wasn't minutes. driving yeah. at the time. Oh, shit. I had to like okay. figure out the bus schedule for this city to city <laughs> bus. It was still part of the local system because there were enough sure. people traveling back it's and a, forth. This is a nerd dream like, come true. How where do you're I just get like... there? I think it was a work day, so I had to like take a Tuesday off right. uh, of my job and hop on a bus at some weird time and get there around noon. Um, so I go and it's yeah, got to be it's a like, two-hour bus ride there and back. Yeah, uh, well, there and then two hours back. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Just because uh, of stops and routing and yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, the main part was an expressway, so once it got on the highway, you were good for a while. But uh, good, great. yeah, but yeah, good it, for you. it took me it took me a while to get there. Uh, I got the book, I got it signed. It's uh, this one. I'm sorry, I know this isn't a show and tell, but, but this is the cover. The video is available season, on YouTube. Oh, that's very beautiful. Nice. And uh, here's the here's the, the so. He um, signed it. Time Warp, Time Warp Comics had this plate that they put in mm -hmm. for him to sign on the hardcover ones. And it's like numbered 95 out of 150. Sure. Um, and But the thing is, it's like, I talked, you know, other, other places just had him sign the book. I don't know what Time Warp Comics was trying to prove by having this <laughs> book plate Special. that was numbered. It was yeah. very weird. Right. Um, so, yeah. Um, anyway, so yeah, that was the first time I met uh, Neil Gaiman, and I've I've been to a number of signings, uh, both in the Denver area. It's nice being in a city where people stop, because uh, yes. he would stop in Denver regularly, um, either at a comic shop. Um, uh, yeah, you're in the uh, San Francisco, the Bay Area now, right? Now I'm in the San Francisco area. I've seen him a number of times around here. Um, he, uh, his son, um, not the younger one with Emil. Uh, with Amanda Palmer, but uh, his grown-up son, who he had with his first wife, right. um, is living up in the kind of North Bay, Napa County area. Okay. Uh, and so sometimes he'll do a stop at uh, at Santa Rosa when he's going to visit his son. Okay. He'll be like, hey, I'm going to be in the area at this time. Do you guys want to? And they're like, yes, please. Yes. We'll put you in. I'm we'll so, send it out. I wish you had more kids. And they were spread right. out more. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> Um, and one of those, um, my, my current girlfriend and I, uh, we paid for the meet and greet mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. um, I had, I had done some meet and greets with, uh, with Weird Al Yankovic and it was very much like a signing line yeah. where it was like, bring something up, you know, we'll, we'll give you a set list or a picture, yeah. uh, but, or you can bring something, but he'll sign a couple things. You can take a picture with him and then on to the next person. Right. And so it was much more like a signing line. The Neil Gaiman meet and greet at, uh, at Santa Rosa it's like before the before the show, they brought us in, they put us in a small room, we showed up like an hour, hour and a half early. Okay. And then when he gets there, he, he has an assistant with him to kind yeah. of keep things focused so he doesn't right. miss his stage time. But um and we have reserved seats. Everybody has reserved seats anyway in the theater, sure. so we don't have to worry about scrambling in for a seat. But you know, group of uh, again, maybe 20 to 40 people mm -hmm. sitting around tables. They have snacks available. Okay. We have some snacks. A gamin comes in and he just, it, it's, he just walks the room and talks to people for a few minutes at a time and wonderful. Rela it felt like what I thought a meet and greet should be instead well, of a signing Well, note to self, if, uh, if ever meet and greets uh, are in my future, don't necessarily just do, well, cause you know, like uh, merch lines. You know, like when it's just the, that's what if that's the weird elk thing has a little bit of that vibe to it, except for that you've bit. already purchased the thing. You don't have to buy anymore, <laughs> but he'll, right, right. and it's nice to get a picture and, and to sign stuff, but I'm Absolutely. sure Neil Gaiman was willing to do that too. Well, and I was wearing a, a shirt that was, I had bought that was part of a benefit for the uh, comic book legal defense fund. Sure. Um, which one? And uh, which shirt? I had, was... I, 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 we get them every year. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, it was it was the one that had, I, I think I have two of them. Right. That the one that I wore was the one of um, of Neil as Aziraphale with the flaming sword over his shoulder. Awesome. Do you have that one? I don't have that one. Okay. It's um, uh, we must have skipped some years or something. <laughs> but that's, maybe. This, and some of them were more comfortable than others. Yeah. Like for some reason they they're using a different. I was like, if they found a brand that they liked. And then I would know what that brand was. Yeah. I could. It would help. 
I feel like I have literally hundreds of t-shirts. Um, I have about you get a free new Dork Forest t-shirt for doing this program, by the way. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> which which I, the I new have... design is coming out. I should get it next week. Ooh. It's not a new design. It's a new color. It's uh, the okay. Black Ranger t-shirt is phased oh, okay. out. And okay. the green and brown Dork Forest t-shirts are phased out. So right. it's going to be the Dork Forest logo on a black t-shirt. Perfect. So there you go. I wear a go. lot of black. You wear a lot of black. <laughs> so which one are you wearing today? Oh, so this is um, this is a fan one. Someone oh, did a tarot card death. of death. Yes. From, uh, from the and this yes. was available like through T Fury or one of those kinds of sites. Sure. But it was it was just a lovely image that someone drew up. Uh, so I had to get this. But <laughs> I have a lot of I have a lot of the official ones from Graffiti Designs. Also, um, the uh, boy, uh, I think the first one I got was. Um, a picture of Dream from um, uh, the comic of Ramadan. Oh. Um, where he's holding this globe filled with demons and he's got fireworks going on behind him. Uh, it's just a beautiful shirt. Yeah. Um, Sometimes and uh, and I've still got I've still got all these. Uh, some of them do not fit anymore, so right. they're kind of in a lower drawer, filed yeah. away for um, for a better day or a different for, day, for a different day or to you know just to history have. something right. like that. Jimmy Pardo, scrapbook, right? Jimmy Pardo was on this program and he talked about how he uh, he uh, the his Chicago T-shirts that he had bought in high school and college he had grown mm-hmm. out of them. Mm-hmm. And so he gave them all away, and then he lost a bunch of weight, and now he's been trying to repurchase all of them on eBay, but they're not his, so they don't fit right. Oh, They've been weared man. by someone else, worn by someone right. else. So you are correct to save them. Michael Charbonneau, <laughs> uh, it has been an hour, and I just oh want goodness. people to know that this has been a delight, and it's been a spoiler episode, but it it really, I don't think you can spoil this stuff. It's so fascinating and so dense. And there's so many different angles to it that we haven't really given anything away, I don't think. I, I Well, and I've reread this thing at least five times. Yeah. Um, usually in different formats. I've gotten... Um, I, I have Do you them... have the big... Yes, with the, they are, with the they are right here. That's let me, right. Let me show you one of these. Let me show your audience one of these. Because this is, this is the slip cover. That's right. That's and right. then the book in here. Yeah. The, and the, Andy has absolute... all of them. Absolute Sandman, uh, this this leather tome that would have been appropriate in uh, uh, Roderick Burgess's library. That's his name. I remembered <laughs> now. Um, with with the art just blown up to an incredible size. Yeah, it's uh, really. Have pictures. you read it in that version? Because it's then really this hard. This one I also uh, got oh, signed nice. hugely by Neil Gaiman. That is there. awesome. Is that the first one? This is volume did, one. So did, he I didn't think, sign all, all eight volumes, right? Did he? Uh, is there eight? I have six. Six. Oh, all six. Um, including including the newer one, uh, Overture. Uh, there were five that were the main series. I think I think at least four out of five of these are signed. Oh, that's nice. Uh, um, but, but I've yeah. had a I I would I. I've wanted to reread them, and that would be the way to do it because they're on the bookshelf. Oh, it's but lovely, they're very yes. heavy, and they're very. They are. It's hard to like a comic book. You could just lie there and read them. Right, right. You lie, you lie down on bed, face down. You have the yes. comic book below you. Yes, it's, yes. it's not this a lap thing, comic. You're, that is a lap comic, and you're just like you could hear the I, crackle I think of them. My laptop may weigh less than this volume, exactly. actually. Exactly. So, yeah. Michael, thank you so much for doing the show. Um, it is, uh, it's always a delight to see you and I see you a lot and I appreciate that. Uh, but, uh, it's always uh, wonderful to talk to you about anything. Uh, right. And this, this was fascinating. Everybody should definitely find Neil Gaiman's stuff, find Sandman, uh, watch the shows and enjoy and watch Good Omens too. Cause they did a real nice job with that as well. Yeah. Recently, I recently rewatched Good Omens, uh, net, uh, Prime. <sighs> Sorry, Amazon yep. had had it out. Yeah, Amazon Prime had they had they had recorded it in 4K. Yeah. But it came out just before I got a 4K TV. Oh, so okay. I just recently rewatched it on my 4K TV to get all the all the bright and shinies. Guess what? We could still talk forever, but we're not going to. So Rangers, <laughs> okay. remember the rules out there. Take care of each other. My hat, my hat, my hat. They're dancing around my hat. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> my hat, my hat, my hat. Well, what do you think of that? If it looks like a Mexican hat dance and it sounds like a Mexican hat dance, it's most likely a Mexican hat dance. So take off your hat and let's dance. Yay! Oh, my God. Thank we you. Why don't we just call that as the end of the show?